song number 140, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, He is holy and just, by His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true, by His mercy He proves He is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, now lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Pray it started when Jesus came into your heart, number 503. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lighted my soul for it's long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy of my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from the wandering, going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy of my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go since Jesus came into my heart. What y'all give up for? Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy of my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, and if Jesus is in your heart, a melody rings within that, and joy comes to you right over in the next page, five hundred and two. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there 
rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Twill be my endless theme in glory, with the angels I will sing. It will be a joyous harmony when the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. And when he enters our heart, when we Give him a heart when we sing that song, he turns it into something beautiful, number 507. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he Brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. And that beautiful thing is that that love of God lifted me, stirred our hearts, made us joyful. What a wonderful song, Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling, in his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry ways. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be. Be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Flo, if you'll just stay there a minute, turn to number 800. In light of the things that's happening in our country as of yesterday, I think we just need to sing this song again. And this is the prayer we have to have after the song. We'll have a time of prayer. Uh, I had a special m m uh, music for this morning and everything, but the Lord laid it on my heart. We need this instead. Uh, we need to come together 
as a people and ask the Lord to heal our land. Heal our land, Father, heal our land. Hear our cry and turn our nation back to you. Lord, heal our land. Hear us, O Lord, and heal our land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Again, heal our land, Father, turn our nation back to you. Lord, heal our land. Hear us, O Lord, and heal our land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Heavenly Father, we come in your presence this morning humbling ourselves, trying to understand the things that are happening. But Lord, in light of your word and your message on our hearts, we shouldn't wonder. We have a nation that's drawing farther and farther away from you. And as we've seen yesterday, we think that a certain man's going to change things. And the only man that was ever on earth that will change things is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, my prayer is that you heal our land. when someone would take the life of an individual and attempt to take the life of another because of hatred. Because they don't like what they say. Because of who they are is wrong. And Lord, we need to pray that our nation turns back to you. Lord, we got to pray that our nation doesn't look at all the things that this world can offer, but what you can. And Lord, we come together this morning to worship you. And Lord, I pray that the many churches that are meeting this morning are having this same time of prayer. But it's not a prayer that that they're just saying uh, to speak words in light of the things that are happening. But Lord, it's a heartfelt prayer. May our hearts be in tune with you. May you see our struggle. May you see our pain. May you see our worry. May you see the things in our life that we just don't understand. And Lord, we're asking why. But Lord, you've already given us the answer. The why is because of the sinful condition of the people of this earth right now. And so many times, as we've seen in history, we can rejoice in the United States for what you've done for us because of your people living a life for you, but we're growing farther and farther away. And Lord, I pray that the hatred in people's hearts do not grow to the point where there's more bloodshed because of the hatred of the one person. And so many things can stem from this. But Lord, I pray your spirit rides over this earth and convicts hearts 
and draws people close to you and convicts us to deliver the message of your saving grace and that this is not a way to solve things anymore. So Lord, heal our land. Our nation needs to turn back to you. And may it start in each one of our hearts here this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalms number 122 this morning. When I started looking into this psalm, and you'll see by the first verse, I, I, I was amazed at the excuses that people use for not going to church. And I was looking on the internet to find out what the you know, surveys say about the number one excuses that people give for not going to church. And I actually found this little parody of excuses that people gave. And what if we took the excuses people use for church and instead people use them for not washing their hands? I mean, you wash your hands every single day. It's something you do. Sometimes you don't even think about it. You just wash your hands because you know that's right to do. But what if they use the excuses they use for church when it comes to washing your hands? Well, they might say, well, you know, I was forced to wash my hands as a child. And people who wash their hands are such hypocrites. They think their hands are cleaner than mine. And there's so many different kinds of soap out there. How do I know which one's right to use? Well, I used to wash, but it got boring. You know, I, I wash, but it's only on Christmas or Easter. Well, none of my friends wash their hands. Do some of them kids still use that nowadays? <laughs> I'll start washing them when I get a little older. I just don't have time to wash my hands. Well, you know, I would, but the bathroom, you know, sometimes it's just too warm, and other times it's just too cold. And I can't get comfortable in there. And you know, the people who make the soap, they're only in it for the money. Well, I pray you're here this morning because you enjoy gathering together with fellow Christians in order to worship God. And don't use these excuses. Uh, this morning we look at the third of the 15 Psalms that we call the Psalm of Ascent. It provides us the framework of the journey uh, for people who are on their way to worship the one true and holy God in the temple and, and the 12 steps they took, they would recite these psalms. And it's also a journey to become a mature disciple of Jesus. We began a couple weeks ago with Psalms 120, it, it pointing out the importance of uh, repentance in your journey, about saying no to the lies of this world and, and yes to the truth of God. Last week we saw Psalms 121, and we focused on the need to trust God in our journey and turn to Him for our help. And today, if you think about it, every one of us got out of bed, got ready, and came to this church. We spent the morning here already singing, praying together, listening to God's Word, sharing fellowship with one another. But it's not just happening here. This is also happening right now at this time at churches all across this city, all across our country, all across this continent, all across our world. And even though the number is getting smaller of the people who go to church, they say that more people get together on Sunday to go to church in this world than they do to engage in any other activity. But at the same time, we've met people that when they're invited to come to church, they have their reasons for not going. They say things like, well, you know, that's my only day I can sleep in. Or I've heard this one, I don't know how many times, I don't have to go to church to worship God. Or I'm a spiritual person, I'm just not religious, so I just can't seem to go to church. But if you counter these excuses with words of God, it's likely they're just going to come up with another excuse to take its place, why they don't want to be in a church service. 
But even more interesting are the reasons people have for attending church. I mean, think about this. No one was forced to attend church and come to worship this morning. It's voluntary. Nobody handcuffed any of you and, and drug you here this morning, except maybe an occasional husband or a child. That's the exception. But they say it's a good test of someone's values is what they do with their spare time and what they do when they don't have anything to do. So as we get into our scripture this morning, I need you to think about these questions. Why are you here this morning? What led you to get up this morning, get ready, and walk through that door? Is there any other place you'd rather be right now? When you come here on Sunday mornings, is the time you spend here inspiring? Are you truly glad to be here? When you get up, does your heart leap with joy thinking about going to church? When you get here, does it encourage you for your walk with Christ? Does it challenge you to walk more faithfully in your relationship with Christ? Does it, does it move you through the words and the deeds that happen here to share your faith with others? And what happens when you leave? Do you take the service with you? So think about that as we start this next psalm on our journey to reach the Lord. And it's a psalm about someone who is overjoyed to go to church and worship God. Psalms 122, a song of degrees of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord, our God will seek thy good. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, may these words teach us to be overjoyed and excited about coming together to worship in the house of the Lord. It's in your son's name I pray. I love how this sound begins. It begins with an invitation to worship. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Right off, the people that are singing this psalm are excited about getting together to worship Him. The Lord Almighty. When was the last time you invited someone to church and they were excited you asked them to go? When was the last time you were excited to go to church? We looked at why so many people decided to stay home from church. So now I want to look at why would someone go to church? And Psalms 122 gives us reasons to go to church and worship together as a congregation. And it, it also tells us what we take with us when we leave. So that our worship of God on Sunday morning actually spills over into the rest of the week. So when we come to the church and we worship together, true worship gives structure to your life. It says in verse 3, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. This verse is 
probably referring to the architectural city, how, how the stone and the masonry and the pieces uh, were all fit together on the buildings. There weren't no loose stones. There weren't no leftover pieces. There weren't no gaps in the wall. Everything fit together. Everything was in harmony. Each piece was doing what it was made to do. But there's a little bit more here than the architecture of a city that it's talking about. Ge Jerusalem is a geographical location, but it was also the center of Hebrew worship. For the ancient Hebrews, being in Jerusalem reminded them of their foundation of faith. It reminded them that ultimately their lives and their stories were shaped by God. Jerusalem to them was the symbol and the sign of God's presence in our world. And just like the structure of the city itself, the Hebrews knew that only through God would all these pieces of everyone's life fit together. In other words, God is here with us, and it is God who helps make sense of the things that are happening to all of us. We may not understand what happened yesterday, but God is making sense of it to us as we draw closer to Him. So what was true for the Hebrew people is also true for us today. Just when nothing in life seems to work together, when nothing during our week has made sense, when we feel like a loose stone in a wall that's about to fall out, nothing fits together in our life, I look forward to worship. I can't wait to be here. We come before God. We pray together. We encourage one another. We hear God's word. We're reminded that God saves us. We're reminded that he heals us and redeems us. And then God takes all those pieces of this life that we don't understand, and he fits them in ways that we never could, built as a city that's firmly bound together. Think about that phrase, built as a city, compact firmly together in our scripture, it says. The, the word compact there was never used for buildings. It was meant for human alliances. And if you were to rewrite this, the New English Bible translation says this, where people come together in unity. So, so when people went to Jerusalem to worship God, they were of one accord. They were together. They were one. So on this journey, the people, not the city or the structure, are in view. I don't come here because this is a wonderful building. I don't come here because it's comfortable in here. Sometimes when we sit in these seats for a long time, it's uncomfortable to be here. I come here because of you all to come together and worship God. It's about the people it's not so much about Jerusalem architect that's being praised, but it's the fact that Jerusalem had the ability to bring people together just as this building does. And ultimately, it was God who was binding everything together. It's God who makes us one. It's God who unites us. And He's the only one that can do that. I mean, think, could you imagine this scene at this time when they went to worship? You'd start at a little town in a village all over Israel. You'd have a few dozen people would come out of their room, out of their houses and everything, and, they, and they'd set off together early in the morning. The, the women were carrying the infants on their backs, and the men were leading the donkeys with all the provision. The older people were riding in carts, and they began walking, and, you know, they'd have the usual chatter, and, you know, the weather's real good today, and did you hear about how the football team did, and, and the kids are really messing up, and... And the crops are, you know, they're all right this year. I wish we'd get a little rain or something on them. And, th and they would do their usual talking. But then someone in the crowd would start singing one of these psalms. And one by one, other people would join in. And they'd be traveling down the road singing these psalms. And, and they'd meet up with the next group at the next village where more sons and daughters of Abraham were gathering together, traveling to the same destination. They grow louder and louder, and the singing now starts to get loud and exuberant. 
Miles pass by, more and more people join the groups. They're walking, they're talking, they're singing, and they finally come to the city, and you can see every road in the city is filled with all these pilgrims converging on Jerusalem. And you hear them as one voice, thousands of voices, all singing, all raised together in praise and worship. Boy, could you imagine what that would be like in our world today? I mean, you ever been to a concert and everything, and, and they stop singing, and they turn the microphone on the crowd, and the crowd starts singing a song, how that just really just stirs you. Could you imagine if we heard the hymns of God being sung like that? God binds us together. He gives us gifts and ways of serving, which emphasize how much we need each other to truly worship Him. There's a lot we can do together that we could never do on our own. It says in verse 4 that the tribes go up. The tribes of the Lord, they go up to Jerusalem. A tribe was a family or a bunch of families that were connected together. Sort of like us as a church. We're not all the same. And when we come to church, we have a variety of backgrounds. We have a variety of circumstances in our life. We have different situations. But we all come together to do one thing this morning, and that's worship. There is unity, but there's also diversity. In Revelation chapter 7... Verse 9, it says this, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white and the palm branches in their hands. What a powerful image. God's people gathered from all walks of life, coming together to do what? Worship. He doesn't make us all alike so we get along. He makes us get along because of the love of Christ, because of the Spirit of God. He enables us to be unified in Him and work together to complete His will in this world. And even if we don't always get along, which that happens sometimes, being in church and that happening actually teaches us to love. Because apart from God, there's no way we could be unified together. Despite how different we are, despite the fact that we all come from different places, different families, different circumstances. And if Jerusalem was God's presence in this world, then the church should ultimately be the community of humans coming together and working and worshiping Him. People should be able to say, that's a place to go worship God. And when we worship together, it grows our need to be in a relationship with God. Paul Scherer says, the Bible wastes very little time on the way we feel. Why is that? Well, Eugene Peterson said, Feelings are great liars. What would happen if we only did things we felt like doing? Think about that. What would happen if we only did things we felt like doing? How much work would get done? How much parenting would get done? How much studying would get done? How much shopping would... Well, some of y'all may like that. How much housework would get done? How much yard work would get done? I mean, think about this. If we only did things we felt like doing, how much would get done? And I'm not a fan of doing some things, but that doesn't mean I don't do them. Sometimes you have to. And Scripture reminds us of the importance of being together to fulfill the things that God wants in our life. Hebrews 10, 25. Not neglecting to meet together as there's the habit of some. And, and Psalms 122, in a sense, is telling us, I don't care if you feel like it or not. This is a command of God, 
And this is what is good and right for you. And this is something God requires of you. It's not about your feelings. We're not here today to make you feel good. It's about God and worshiping Him. And worship is an act which develops feelings for God. It's not a feeling for God. You hear, you hear the difference there? It develops feelings for God, which then is expressed in the acts of worship. And sometimes it's just about getting started. That's why worship is a command or a decree. That's why worship grows our need to be in a relationship with God. I didn't say our worship grows our relationship with God. While that's true, I said worship grows our need to be in a relationship with God. We need God. And sometimes we need to be reminded about how just much we need God. And worship grows our essential need to be in that relationship. If we neglect worship, if we neglect coming to church to worship together with God's people, it won't be long before our relationship with God begins to be infected. And God gets pushed to the edge more and more as, as the days pass. And we start to live as though life depends more on us than it does on God. And the problem is, and, and why we do this, it's our natural sinful inclination to do this. That's why when you miss a couple of days of church, ain't it real hard to get back going again? That's why. Worshiping together as God's people is one of the main ways we keep that from happening. Listen to the Hebrews again, which talks about the importance of meeting together. But instead of reading just verse 25, I'm going to read 23 and 24 before it. And this is why we worship together. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to do good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. We should be, we talk about, oh, the Lord's coming back. There's things happening in this world. The day's approaching. We, we should be stirring each other. We should be provoking each other to love and good works. We, we should be encouraging one another. We should be exhorting one another. As Christians, we can't hold fast to our faith and to have hope in the Christ that we have on our own. We can't love our neighbor without the help of fellow Christians. We need one another. We need encouragement. And meeting together is what helps us be supportive and encouraged to one another. I need Sunday morning. I need to see you all. Meeting together with fellow believers for the specific purpose of worship is how we're able to hold fast to that confession in Jesus. It reminds us that we can't be Christians in this world on our own. We can't live without fellow Christians, and we definitely can't live apart from God. Therefore, we should not neglect worshiping together. And when we're together in true worship, it draws our attention to God's Word. Verse 5 speaks of judgment. And one of the biblical definitions of the word judgment is this, the decisive word by which God straightens things out and puts things right. God's word is a word that gets things done. It's God's word that puts mercy in our life. It's God's word that puts love in motion in our relationship. It's God's word that provides order in our lives. It opens the way for forgiveness in our heart. It makes room for grace in our midst. And we use God's word throughout all of our worship together. It's, it's not just in the sermon. We hear God's word in the prayers we pray together. We return God's Word to Him in praise and petition. The songs we sing remind us of God's Word, and some of them actually use Bible passages. Whenever Scripture is read, we hear the words given to the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the saints. 
And when we hear a sermon, we hear how those words are applied on our lives. And our entire worship service is centering our attention on God's word and what it means for our life. A great reason to worship him. And God's word accomplishes the purpose God has for it. Listen to Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. Isaiah chapter 55, 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and return it not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I send it. And ultimately, when we think of God's word, it draws us to Jesus. The word became flesh. So if our service is centered around the Word of God, then it's centered on Christ. Who He is, what He's done, who we are as a result of it, and how we can be His people. Let us go to the house of the Lord. There are so many reasons the psalm gives for us continuing to worship together. But what we take with us when we leave, when we walk out those doors, has today made a difference in your life? Our psalm today closes with a prayer from Jerusalem and asks God that there might be peace and security within its walls. It's an ordinary prayer, one we just prayed. It's, it uses ordinary words. It asks God to bless and bring peace to Jerusalem, and it's something the Hebrews worked at every day in their life. While they ate meals, while they were doing their chores, while they were living their life, they cried for peace. And we're called to do the same thing when it comes to praying. When it comes to our worship time together. When it comes to praying for each other. And this Psalm 122 is, is not a Sunday prayer. It's an in-between Sunday prayer. Our worship doesn't stop on Sundays. Today should be the day your worship begins. It's the first day of the week. It's a day that should get you going. It's the one that should help you handle all the days till the next Sunday. And our time of corporate worship should not be a place we come to satisfy our hunger for our Lord. Today should be the day it just whets our appetite so we desire for the Lord all week long. It's a hunger for peace and security. Peace because God's will is being completed in us in this world. It should give us a relaxed state because we know that everything right now that is happening in this world is because God is here and God is taking care of it and God is with us. This prayer for peace and security is also interesting because it's written in a time when Jerusalem wasn't secure. And if you know history, Jerusalem has never been a place of peace. So peace always remains a prayer request. It always remains something we should ask God for. But true peace will never fully be realized in this life. And the peace that we should have as followers of Jesus Christ should be despite our circumstances. And that's why the Bible says it's a peace that passes all understanding. I don't understand why you can have peace in light of all the things that's happening. Because my peace is not found in this world. So we should come here every Sunday morning the same way they entered Jerusalem. 
turn your radio on, roll your windows down, and sing some good Christian music. And let people look at you and go, huh? The joy that they had to go. I mean, they were excited because somebody came up to them and said, hey, it's time. Let's go to the house of the Lord and worship. And they were excited to do that. They still had hard times and difficult times. But these things should not determine how we live because we know the future. Hillsong had a song out a couple years ago, and it went like this. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Never cease to worship and shout to the Lord. Let this morning be a time that we want to shout. We want to be glad. They said to us this morning, let us go to the house of the Lord. The next time you invite somebody to church, ask them where their joy is. Are you glad to go to the house of the Lord? You know, I used to tell a joke. I had a drug problem when I was young. I was drugged to church every single morning. I'm glad I was. But it got to the point, you know, where I was glad to go to the house of the Lord. And I need this. I, need, I could not make it through the work without Sunday. I need your smiles and your encouragement and your love and your hugs and your joy and the grace and the mercy. But most of all, I need the Lord. And that's why we're here today. That's what today is all about. Worshiping the one true God. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for Psalms 122 and, and, and the message that it brings this morning May we understand what it means to rejoice, what it means to be glad to come together and worship you. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And may this just be the time that we start. May this just stir our hearts to worship all week long and serve you. Lord, we thank you. We pray for peace in our country. We, we pray that the peace starts in the heart. And Lord, may we shout this morning what a joy it is to worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's all stand number 504. For without him, I could do nothing. Without Him I could do nothing Without Him i surely fail Without Him I would be drifting Like a ship without a sail Jesus, oh Jesus know him today do not turn him away oh Jesus my
Charlie's come this morning and he surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. He's come to have spiritual Christian baptism this morning to show others what Christ has done in his life. I just have to ask you this morning as a church how you covet to be with him here. He's come to join with this church. He's come to serve the Lord with this church. And what is the... Uh, what do y'all think? Y'all ready to, to encourage him? Are y'all ready to, to uplift him? Are y'all ready to help him in his walk with the Lord this morning? All those that are ready, let me hear an amen. 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 That sounds like everybody right there, brother. You just stand up here. Y'all come. We'll have a word of prayer. You come give him the right hand of fellowship. We'll fill this out here in a minute. But just praise the Lord. He understands. I've talked with Charlie. Charlie truly knows what it means in his life. He has surrendered his life fully to the Lord, and he's going to be a great asset for what the Lord's going to do with him. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just came here this morning to worship you. And what an accumulation, what a joy to see one come forward and say, Jesus is my Lord, and I'm going to serve him the rest of my life. What a joy it is. And Lord, may you wrap your arms around him and comfort him. The devil's going to attack him right now. We as a church will be there for him. We'll comfort him. We'll guide him. We'll be part of his life. He's become part of this body to serve him here. And Lord, we just praise you for everything this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all come forward and give him the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> 